I'll begin this afternoon's session with a brief introduction. Welcome to the Canadian Institute of Forestry's National Electronic Lecture Program. My name is Sharon Young, and I will be hosting today's session. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024, and this is the seventh session in the e-lecture series entitled Sharing Knowledge on Some Key Initiatives Happening Across the Canadian Forest Service. This series is brought to you by the Canadian Forest Service and Canadian Wood Fiber Center. The CIF IFC is very pleased to collaborate and host these webinars. For today's session, we are very pleased to have Yan Bulongji, who will give an exciting presentation titled, Assessing Recent Trends in Forecasted Fire Behavior Indices from Changes in Forest Landscapes and Climate Over the Past 45 Years. To kick things off, Ian Boulangi holds a PhD degree in biology from the University of Quebec at Rimouski. Between 2010 and 2013, he was a postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Dr. Sylvie Gaussier and Phil Burton at the Laurentian Forestry Center, where he worked to define homogeneous fire regime zones in Canada. Since then, he has been a researcher in forest ecology. His research interests include the projection of natural disturbance regime in Canada, mainly fire and spruce butworm in relation to climate change, the projection of forest landscapes and wildfire habitats, and the dynamics of spruce butworm dispersal using weather radar. Dr. Boulangery is an associate professor at the University of Quebec at Rimouski, at Laval University, and at the University of Quebec in a BDB, the Miss Kamang. With that, I will now pass it over to Yen. Thanks a lot. Uh, welcome, everyone. So uh, thanks for, uh, for the invita invitation today. Uh, so yes, as it was uh, just told before, I will show you a research that we are conducting, well, a few research projects that we are currently conducting uh, within our, our lab. Uh, that, and this work is in collaboration with a lot of people. So a lot of people uh, from uh, the SKF Center in UCAM, uh, and also people from uh, the uh, MR, MRNF in, uh, in Quebec, as well as other people here in, uh, in our camp. So just to give you an overview of, uh, because we're, we'll be talking about fire today, so a uh, brief overview of uh, fire regimes uh, in, in Canada, as we call it. So you can see that on average, um, well, actually fire is one of the most important natural disturbance in, the, in Canada, especially in the boreal forest. Uh, on average, there's about 2 million hectares that are burning each year. Of course, that's very, very variable from a year to another. And you can see that it's quite heterogeneous uh, throughout Canada where fire is actually occurring and where uh, area burn is actually uh, occurring also. You, you can see that, for example, there are a lot more fires within uh, the, the, the northern part of the prairies in the, the Northwest Territories in Alberta and uh, central part of, uh, of um, British Columbia, for example. And in Quebec, most of the fires are occurring uh, close to the James Bay area in the northwestern part of the, uh, of the province. Of course, fire can occur pretty much everywhere in the country, but some places are more uh, exposed to, uh, to others. And of course, that's not a secret to, to anyone. You, you probably know that the climate is warming, warming pretty fast. Uh, last year was quite exceptional in terms of uh, of weather conditions. We were way above uh, the previous records uh, for uh, many months um, at the end of the year last year uh, at the global scale. Uh, at the end of the year, we end up with uh, temperature anomalies that were pretty close to plus 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to the pre-industrial era, uh, which is quite a lot. That was a record. And we are already on our way on 20, uh, in 2024 to uh, be close to this this record we are already uh, above the 2023 temperatures for the beginning of, uh, the beginning of the year so it means that with that there's a lot of consequences there's there's a lot of impacts and 
for example, last year was one of the of those impacts of the exceptional uh, weather weather conditions that we have uh, that we had all across Canada, because you probably know it. Last year was exceptional in terms of forest fires. Um, actually, uh, these forest fires burn approximately fifteen million hectares, which is, as I mentioned before, you know that uh, you maybe remember that the the annual average for Canada is about two million hectares. So uh, more than seven times the um, the the annual average, uh, more than twice as the previous record that was uh, in 1989. So and these fires were were fueled by exceptional uh, weather conditions that were spatially extensive, uh, uh, that were also persistent in time, um, and the 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 weather condition themselves were extreme. And you can see that um, all parts of Canada have uh, I've seen some kind of a huge or exceptional fire activity. It was not only in few regions. So uh, the western part, the northern part, and the eastern part of the country all burned quite a lot. And if you are um, um, looking at the at the graph that are on the the right side of the of the slide, these are the the different. Um, fire weather indices um, for the different years since 1950 to 2023, uh, average for the whole country and for the whole year. And each dot actually represents a year uh, for the given uh, fire weather index, uh, index. And you can see that uh, actually 2023 is the red dot. And so the, this red dot is way above any other uh, years uh between 1950 and 2022 uh, so that the record were beaten by a huge margin in terms of fire weather indices uh we can look at the the pattern of those um where the um, the fire weather indices were particularly extreme uh you have here uh the area that was covered or the places where we the we record uh, fire weather indices that were above the 95th percentile and the number of days where those uh, extremes were, were recorded. So you can see that many places uh, in Northwest Quebec, in Northern Alberta, British Columbia, Northwest Territories, actually where the fire did occur and uh, uh, where those big fire did occur. Um, so this that's where the the extreme fire weather were uh, recorded, and you have also the on the um, the lower side of the of the slide the number of blocking days. So blocking days is where you have what we call atmospheric blocking. So where when the, there is a uh, a high pressure system, for example, that is staying at the same time for uh, at the same place for a long time, like few days or few weeks in some some cases. Uh, when you have those kind of atmospheric patterns, it means that uh, you have long stretches of a sunny, uh, dry, probably and very warm uh, temperature in the in the summer. And actually, last year was the 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 total area that was affected by by those blocking was um, uh, on on record level. Uh, we we know that actually climate change is directly involved in those uh, exceptional weather patterns. Uh, for example, uh, we contributed last year to a study that was um, aiming to estimate the impact of climate change on the, um, the intense or the, the, the severe weather conditions in Northwest Quebec, those conditions that actually fueled the, the fire there. And we, we conclude actually that those conditions were at least twice as probable right now just because of climate change. So it doesn't mean that those conditions were not happening before. It's just that for now, because the temperature uh, globally is increasing, the drought is also increasing, those conditions are now twice as likely to occur right now than before. And they will be also twi uh, more than twice too likely to occur in the um, relative to today uh, because of climate change in 2050, for example. Uh, we know also that the drought drought conditions last year were exceptional 
especially for uh, for Quebec. Actually, uh, they were at record level for the month of June for uh, the eastern part of the James Bay and the uh, the northern part of the of the province. And we we kind of see that although those kind of uh, extreme drought conditions were quite decreasing since the, the beginning of the 20th century up to 1980. Now, since the last 20 or 40 years, they are uh, increasing again. So we can see much more of those extreme drought conditions in the in the last uh, the last years. And we will probably have more of them in the upcoming decades. And actually, that's a global thing. Uh, globally, we know that the weather conditions are getting much more conducive for fire uh, in terms of um, initial uh, spread index, in terms of fire weather conditions, in terms of uh, vapor pressure deficit. Uh, all of those things, uh, those weather conditions that are driving at some point fires or either ignitions or, or, or spread, they are increasing in many parts of the world. Uh, in Canada, for example, we know that uh, those conditions are getting much more conducive for uh, for fire, especially out west, um, especially in British Columbia. And that's pretty much why the, 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 the experience very, very extreme um, uh, wildfire years uh, since 2017, for example. Uh, and those conditions also contribute at some point to make the fuel, so the vegetation, much more uh, flammable because it it is much more much drier and same as for the the, the trends uh, record for uh, fire weather indices. I mean you have here the the trends for the um, the decrease in the fuel moisture content. And again in Canada you can see that there are a lot of places where we have significant trends in more in drier vegetation, especially out west again but also in northern part of uh, Alberta, Ontario, and northwestern part of, of Quebec. So basically where the, the fires are occurring. Um, and what is also very interesting to uh, and very important to note is that those, um, those changes, those, those trends that are occurring worldwide, they are actually worse in Canada because we are at northern latitude and we are then experiencing uh, increase in temperature that are twice as much as the rest of the globe. Uh, and these uh, increase in temperature, they are most likely to occur in winter and in the northwestern part of the country, but still we can see some increase in temperature uh, during the fire season, for example, during spring, during summer, and even during fall, uh, depending on the area. So of course that will, uh, and that is actually, uh, having an impact on, on fire. And if we are uh, looking at what happened since the, the late 50s in terms of annual area burn and number of fires, but in, in, in this case it's for uh, area burn, we can see that since the late 50s, there are many areas in, the, in Canada that are actually experiencing a significant increase in uh, annual area burn. Uh, actually, uh, at the at, at the Canada level, um, we are experiencing an increase in uh, in annual area burn by uh, three hundred thirty thousand hectares more per per decade. Actually, it it, it doubled since uh, nineteen sixty, for example. And fire size is also increasing because of that. I mean, the large fire are getting larger. And you can see in the western part of the uh, of Quebec that there is an increase in uh, in area burn um, in the eastern James Bay homogeneous fire regime zones, for example. But this increase is not significant. Well, it was not significant before because this trend was uh, assessed between 1959 and 20 and 2015. Uh, it doesn't uh, include the uh, 2023 fires, but still uh, there is an increase, but yet not not significant. But because uh, why we are seeing those increase in this area? To understand why we are seeing those trends, we have to understand how fire is actually, or how the different factors, uh, environmental factors have an impact on fires. Uh, we know that of course, climate or weather, depending on the spatial or temporal scales we are looking at. 
will have an impact. So the the, the warmer, the drier, the windier the, the conditions are, the most likely fire will be will ignite or will were spread on the um, on the, on the territory. So we have first to assess if there are any trends in this area that could explain to 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 uh, to a given extent if uh, those fires occurring in northwestern Quebec, for example, are driven by by climate. And to do that, we uh, are using uh, the uh, Era 5 uh, reanalysis. So this is a top-notch, I would say, uh, reanalysis that are that is produced by the ECMWF, so the Copernicus, so the European uh, folks. Uh, and those uh, reanalysis are actually we can have temperature, we can have all the the different um, variables that are necessary to calculate. Uh, fire weather indices, for example, and we can have them to see from 1950 to 2020 and see to which point actually there are any trends in those uh, conditions all across the, the country. Uh, we are assessing so the uh, these uh, these parameters for all of Canada, but we are especially focusing uh, here for today on uh, on Quebec. But when you are doing that, you have to um, to make some corrections. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the uh, FWI calculations, so FWI calculations necessitate that you have several parameters uh, calculate at noon. But of course, noon is different on a solar point of view uh, from a place to another, depending on the, the time zones you're, you're looking at. And when you're looking at those parameters that are at very fine scale, uh, we are talking about 30 kilometer scale, for example, for the era five um, uh, cells approximately. Uh, it means that when you are switching time zones, you see those kind of, uh, of artifact from a zone to another. So we have to correct for that. And that's what we have done. Uh, I say we, but it's not we, it's uh, the SCA center actually that has done this uh, this correction, and once this correction is established, you can see on the the left part of the slide, there's no more artifacts that are uh, appearing, and that's that's quite important when you want to uh, to to do those kind of uh, analysis because you don't want to have sharp uh, artifacts like that that are due to uh, to time zones. So once you we once we have done this. We can assess now the, the trends in some very specific uh, weather parameters that are very important for uh, for the fire regime to explain changes in fire regimes since uh, the late uh, the late fifties, for example. And we know that well, it's not a surprise for uh, for anyone here. So mean temperature is increasing significantly during the fire season for much of the country. Uh, that's the case for Quebec, but that's the case for almost everywhere in the um, in the country especially out west uh in terms of precipitation now so that's that's quite the opposite here well not the opposite but it's getting uh, some kind of wetter at some point uh, in some place in some place uh especially in southern quebec uh, in the prairies uh, on the western uh, coast eastern coast also so this is always for the fire season part so you can see that the, 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 those uh, precipitation are, are actually increasing. So to which point this will affect the fire weather parameters? Because on one side you have warmer conditions and then on the other side you have wet, wetter conditions. Um, and one thing that is very, very uh, important to mention is the snow water equivalent. So, uh, and this snow water equivalent during the month of March, April and May is, is decreasing a lot. Uh, almost everywhere. So it means that the snow is melting much, much quicker than before. And if the snow is melting much, much quicker, it means that the fire season can start much earlier. And that's pretty much what we are seeing this year. I don't know where you are located in the country, but uh, for example, in Quebec, uh, we have one of the earliest, if not the earliest uh, start of the fire season in, in Southern Quebec on March 7th, because uh, the, the, the snow was already melted, even though tomorrow there will be about 25 centimeters of snow there. But anyway, the, so the, it was already melted before uh, the end of February, February, actually. And we are all 
already having this year a very depleted snow cover in much of Canada. So we could um, expect that the fire season uh, could uh, start very quickly. Uh, so that's kind of an example of, uh, of the, the impact of climate change. Uh, and when we are translating those uh, different uh, trends in weather parameters for fire weather indices, for uh, some very important fire weather indices, and we can see some trends that are very, very important, uh, especially uh, for the drought code uh, on the, for the month of July, which is very important to, to explain uh, area burn in much of the boreal forest in Canada, actually. Uh, these, uh, those drought code, but the drought code itself is getting much, uh, much higher. So much, the conditions are getting much drier. That's what we are expecting. Um, and in some part, uh, well, in, in most of the uh, boreal forest or more big part of the of the boreal forest, including in some part of the of uh, western or, or northwest northwestern Quebec, uh, and in terms of uh, maximum value uh, record each year uh, for the fire weather index, it is also increasing uh, in much of Quebec, Ontario, and northern part of the of the prairies also. Uh, so despite having a little bit more precipitation, temperatures are getting so warm actually that this is sufficient to uh, to cause increase in extreme value of uh, fire weather indices. But of course, that's one side of the triangle that I've just shown before. Uh, like I, I was mentioning before, there are a lot of things that are influencing fires, uh, weather, as I mentioned before, but not only, of course, there are the vegetation part and the fuel part. So if fuel or vegetation is indeed changing uh, in the in the area, we could also expect that uh, the fire regime could change in response to those change in, uh, in uh, forest conditions. And you have here uh, Landsat uh, imageries that are that is actually showing how uh, the landscape is indeed changing in, in Quebec since uh, the beginning of the, I think it, the, the first image, it's, it's in 1980, early 1980s, I don't recall. But you can see that the, the red, the dark, uh, dark green color is actually old coniferous forests. But you know, in, uh, when you're going uh, further in times, you have more uh, light colors, which are actually corresponding to an increase in mixed stands or younger stands. Uh, so the, the and mostly because of harvesting that is actually going from the south to the north. Uh, in French, we say uh, "dérouler le tapis" uh, up to the uh, northern uh, limit of the uh, commercial forest. So forest is changing. Few fires also are occurring in the in the landscape, so it it changes the 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 landscape, the composition, uh, the, um, the the forest composition, and uh, because of that, the the flammability of the landscape is also changing. For those who are not familiar with the uh, with how we can translate forest composition and structure into fuel types. Uh, these are the, the CFFDRS fuel types, uh, FBP fuel type, fuel types actually uh, for that is used in Canada. So different forest composition or structure are translate into specific fuel, uh, and this specific fuel have different flammability, different uh, fire behavior. So you can have, for example, C1, which is a spruce lichen woodland, uh, C2 boreal spruce, so close boreal spruce. Uh, for deciduous stands, you can have what we call either D1 or D2. Uh, D1 is before leaves, uh, before uh, deciduous trees has have their leaves, and D2 is uh, when they have their leaves, so the, the flammability of both is different. Uh, slash is also different, so if there are harvesting in some places, you have slash after that, and then the, the, the fire behavior will be different in these uh, these area than uh, for example uh, in C1 or C2 so we have uh, we have actually used those uh, those fuel types 
um, to uh, characterize the... Um, so we have uh, in Quebec what we call the ecoforestry maps uh, that are updated each year, actually, um, at some point with the, with the disturbances each year since 1977. So we can have a, an overview of how fuel is actually changing uh, from time to time uh, since 1977. So we are translating those ecoforestry maps into fuel types, as they are defined uh, before, like, like I just showed. And we are then uh, looking to which, which extent um, those fuels are changing uh, in par parallel in parallel with uh, the change in uh, in weather conditions, because each fuel type will react differently to uh, different uh, weather conditions. And we have to take this into account to see to which point, well, we have to consider both. We have to consider fire weather indices and fuel type to see to which point the, the flammability of the landscape has changed since 1977 in this case. Uh, so we can measure the, these change by looking at fire behavior indices. Uh, we, uh, we, book, uh, we look at two of them, which is the head fire intensity and the rate of spread. Uh, and these are calculated daily between 1977 and 2020, given the fuel type for this year and the weather conditions that are that is daily. And I, I, um, I'm just underlining here that we are, of course, we cannot go very far away in time uh, for uh, the ecoforestry map. So we can only have 1977 uh, as the first year. So it means that the time series that we are looking at for trends is quite short uh, and it will also have uh, um, an impact on the, the significance, I would say, of those trends that we are assessing. So now just looking at the fuel itself, so how they are changing through, uh, through times. Uh, you have here some animated uh, GIFs that are showing, that is actually showing how the, the fuel types are changing from 1977 to 2020. And just recall that the, um, the, the dark green color is actually uh, C2 fuel. So close black spruce forests that are much more flammable than, for example, the yellow color, which are uh, depicting the, uh, the mixed tan. So where there's uh, some kind of a, a portions of a deciduous trees in this. And you have also sometimes appearing some M, what we call M3, M4, so in purple color. So this is because of the uh, spruce bottom outbreaks that, that was causing some mortality in the late 80s. Uh, of course, fuel and the flammability of uh, those forests that are affected by spruce bottom is different from uh, other uh, kind of uh, a fuel types. So you have to, we have to consider that. So the, the, the main point is here that you, you can see some, some kind of trends in the in in changes in the changes in um in, in fuel types. Uh, you see that the the mixed stands are actually occurring more north right now uh, than before. So the the green, the dark green colors are decreasing and the the, the yellowish colors are increasing on the south to north gradient. And that's pretty much what we see here. So we have the different homogeneous fire regime zones for Quebec. These are different from the one that uh, I've shown before for the, the, the Canada as a whole. Um, and, but you can just look at the, at the study area here. So the proportions of the, of the different fuel types that are changing from uh, a year to another. And you, you, you can really see how the, the C2 fuel is actually decreasing in the, in the province. Uh, that's especially the case in the northern part of the of the homogeneous, the north, northern most homogeneous fire regime zones, where actually these are either uh, changed to uh, deciduous at some point, but mostly uh, mixed um, mixed fuel type, and uh, and sometimes like I, I just shown before, there there is quite a lot of purple in the uh, 80s or 90s just because of the spruce bottom outbreak that has also change at some point the, um, the the fuel types there. But the main point is C2 is decreasing and M1, M2 is increasing. And because of, but, and why? <laughs> so uh, most of these, uh, these changes 
is uh, is occurring because of so you have here the the the, the origin or the the factor uh, that change a fuel type to another fuel type. When it's uh, yellow, it means that it's uh, um, uh, clear cuts or harvesting actually that that change the fuel. In green, you have plantation, and in uh, red or orange, you, you have fire that has actually changed the, the fuel. And according to each year, and you can see that for most of the study area, it is because of harvesting that the the fuel types are changing, either in this in this case from C two to M one and two or D one, uh, so deciduous tense. Probably if we are adding 2023 on this uh, graph, though, that will change a lot because there will be a lot of, uh, of fuel types that will uh, that will change uh, this year because of the fires uh, last uh, last year. So uh, if we are so now we can ask ourselves, so to which point uh, weather or or changes in weather or changes in fuel types, have an impact on fire behavior uh, indices. And now we'll, we'll see to which point actually the, the weather is actually changing. So we keep uh, fuel constant in the, in, the, in the landscape and see just how changes in weather conditions could affect the flammability of the, so in this case, the ed fire intensity for the, for, for the different uh, regions. And actually, we can see that you can see some increase in uh, in ed fire intensity, cumulative ed fire intensity at some point that we can call it for uh, some area. Most of them that are located in western part of the of the province. But of course, as I was mentioning before, there's a lot of um, interannual variability. It's very difficult to have significant trends uh, for a very short time intervals that we are uh, looking at. So even though most of the area, actually all of the, the area are experiencing increase in, uh, in weather, in fire prone weather conditions, uh, these are only significant within the, the Western part of the, of, the, of the province. But when we are looking, looking at changes in fuels, so now instead of uh, keeping fuels constant and having um, weather conditions changing, we are doing the, uh, the, the opposite. So we are looking at stable uh, fixed weather conditions and look at how changes in fuel types is having an impact on the, the flammability of the stands of the, of the landscape. And now we can see that for all or almost all uh, area in uh, regions in Quebec, uh, the fuels themselves are getting uh, less and less flammable through uh, through times, uh, with very few exception. Uh, this is especially the case in the northern part of the of the area and at the uh, at the scale of Quebec. So at the lower uh, right uh, lower right, you can see that the, if weather conditions are constant, the fuels themselves are getting much less flammable probably because they are changing from C2 to M1, M1 being less flammable than C2 on average. Now we're putting all these things together. So now that we are considering changes in weather conditions, changes in fuels, let's see how the, the in, in reality, how this impact the, uh, the flammability of the landscape. And again, um, well, we, we don't see any significant trends actually in the in, in the area. Um, so this we can see some increase at some point uh, in uh, in the flammability of the landscape, despite the fact that the fuel themselves are less flammable, uh, all of the things being constant. Uh, but still, the, the time series is quite short, so we cannot have significant uh, trends in, in these graph. Still, the, there is some very specific area uh, in, the, in, in the province where we can see uh, the uh, and significant trends. And most of those significant trends in the flammability of the landscape, when we consider both changes in weather conditions and changes in fuel through times uh, are located in the western part and the northern part of the of the of the area that's where we we are 
we have those cells that are see that are seeing significant increase in uh, weather conditions, in the uh, inflammability conditions. But one thing that we have to look at uh, now, these are the, the mean uh, weather patterns. We didn't look at the extreme uh, fire uh, behavior uh, indices. And you have here the extreme uh, fire indices. So um, we have calculated the number of days where from 1977 to 2020, we did observe um, uh, conditions or daily conditions where the uh, at fire intensity was above 10,000 kilowatt per meter. So these uh, this kind of uh, intensity uh, is is an extreme actually a fire could could cause extreme fire behavior uh, where actually the even the the air tankers are not able to uh, to to suppress a uh, brought down a given a given fire because the intensity of the fire is too too high. And for most of the area, uh, those number of extreme uh, extreme days are actually increasing in the area and they are quite increasing a lot. So even though the average conditions are not significantly increasing at some point, the extremes themselves are indeed increasing for much of the area. So some uh, takeaway messages right now. So we like I mentioned before, we see some significant increase in fire prone conditions, but there's also uh, lots of uh, yearly vari variability. Uh, so mostly in the western part of the, of the province, we see fire weather conditions getting more uh, more harsh or more prone to, uh, to fire. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, there's also a lot of changes in the fuel uh, fuel conditions as, uh, as I mentioned before. so, fuels before were probably for uh, all of the things being equal. So uh, weather being equal, uh, the fuels in 1977, for example, were much more flammable for a given weather conditions that they are today because most of it changed from uh, C2, for example, so closed boreal forest to mixed stands at some point. Um, and this is mostly caused by anthropogenic disturbances, so because of harvesting in this case. Uh, so it means that when you are looking at both kind of things, so fire weather is increasing, fuel is increasing flammability, uh, changes in fuel is actually decreasing flammability. So when you are looking at both, well, it means that the conditions for fire behavior that is actually considering both changes in weather and fuel are kind of stable since a few uh, few decades. Yet, we are indeed observing the uh, very severe fire behavior indices that could have potential impacts on suppression capacities, as mentioned before, because we are observing much more of those extreme uh, days, days with extreme uh, fire behavior uh, conditions. So, as I mentioned before, it's, it's still difficult to conclude what is, if, uh, fuel flammability actually, or the changes in fuel themselves are actually compensating at some point the change in uh, in, 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 the, in fire weather. Um, so we cannot actually conclude to which point uh, uh, we, the increase in annual area burn is directly linked to one or another uh, factor. Uh, of course, having longer time series will, will help a lot. Um, and, but, one thing that we we have to to say one when we are looking back at the 2023 fire season um for those who are familiar with the with the fires that did occur in uh so you have here uh, on the, the the map in the um, the fires that did occur in 2023 in Quebec you see that many of those fires actually occurred in areas where fuel uh has changed a lot and changed for something that is less flammable so even though the fuel is less flammable, we were indeed able to have a very severe fire season in Quebec last year. Why? Because the weather conditions uh, are getting much more uh, severe. Uh, and so the next step also will be to actually consider those uh, fires for 2023. And we are looking at having the same kind of uh, analysis, but for the whole country. Uh, so from a notion to another, to another. 
uh, and we have access to those to uh, to those maps, so we can uh, we can do those those analysis either from a weather point of view, from a fuel point of view, or from the fire behavior point uh, point of view. So that's it. That's pretty much what I I had to say today. So I'm I'm open to any questions now. Thank you, Yen. That was a great presentation. Um, before we proceed to answer the questions, let's take a moment to fill out the post-webinar survey. Uh, just give me one second and I'm going to launch it. So there are two questions in total. You may need to scroll down to see the next question. Okay, the first question in the Q&A pod for Ian is, I noticed on your maps that Nova Scotia seemed to have lower risk, but they still had severe fires. Would fuel accumulation be another significant factor? That's a very good question. And actually, the uh, it, it's also, I mean, the fires that we had last year in Nova Scotia means that even though the, the risk itself is quite, uh, I mean, the exposure is uh, very, very low. I mean, Nova Scotia is not known to have, or recently to have a lot of fires, but when the weather conditions are conducive, when the, the ignition is occurring in a very specific area where fuel types are very flammable and the weather conditions are very uh, fire conducive, it means that we can have uh, a catastrophe like we had last year. And when we are looking at the maps of Tantalan, so to the places that, that burned last year in Nova Scotia, for example, in the suburbs of, uh, of Halifax, uh, the uh, wildland urban interface is very large there. Uh, so the, the forest is really connected between the, the, the houses there, the infrastructure. So this was really uh, a case where um, even though the exposure is not is not great, uh, is not is not high, the the risk itself, if a fire is to occur, is very very high. Thank you, Ian. And Next then one, one thing, Scott, yeah, maybe I can Sorry. add something else. Uh, we we know that this is also an area that was uh, affected by uh, uh, Willie Adelgid, so the Amlock Willie Adelgid at some point. So and that was also affected by. Uh, uh, which hurricane again so but anyway uh, there is questions right now there is studies right now that are conducted or that want to be conducted by uh, Rafael Chavardais in this area that wants to see if the accumulation of fuels in this area because of MLOC will be alleged uh, or uh, hurricanes might have played a role in this uh, in this situation but we don't have answers yet sorry it's fine Okay, the next question for you is, could you comment on any differences in incidence and or severity of fires between the managed and unmanaged forest landscapes in Canada? It's it's very difficult to, to sometimes, of course, the uh, fire suppression has an impact on on fire severity, on on the, but it, it's it's very difficult to to actually assess. We know that uh, the, the fire or the vegetation itself is different from the managed to unmanaged forest. Uh, we are not. Um, I mean, we have differences of uh, of um, the way we are suppressing fire. Of course, within the intensive uh, protection zones and then the uh, the extensive protection zone. So it can have have an impact. I'm I'm not knowledgeable enough, uh, I would say, to uh, to answer this question about severity itself. But of course, that fire suppression could have an impact. But again, uh, weather conditions are really really important when we are talking about severity, uh, because this is really driven by uh, long term drought conditions. So the the longer or the the driest the the drier the 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 substrate is because of long lasting drought conditions. So the more severe the, the fire will be, and this can occur almost uh, 
in every part of the country. And that's basically probably what is uh, explaining the fact that this year we'll probably see a lot of those what we call zombie fires. I don't, some people in, in our group don't like the, the term zombie fire, ghost fire or revival fire, I don't know, uh, because those fires were burning very deep in the in the, the organic layer because it was very dry last year. So it was very severe fire. And then they are uh, reviving in the in 2024 right now because it's, it's much drier. Anyway. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. Given that last year's fire season was driven by extreme weather events and not fuel, are fuel tr treatments still an effective fire mitigation tool? Well, it's not the panacea, of course, uh, but it it uh, it should work. Actually, uh, we, if we are changing the the fuels, we could change the, the the fire behavior itself. Of course, this is not the only thing that we can do to mitigate the impact of fire on infrastructure or communities, but it, it indeed uh, have an impact. But of course, because of climate change, the more severe the weather conditions are, the less effective will be those uh, those those uh, mitigation measures. So we really have to uh, assess how climate change might affect the effectiveness of those uh, mitigation measures, to which point we have to, to which extent we have to conduct them uh, relative to today to bring the, the same protection uh, as uh, for a given uh, a mitigation measure for today. So we, we have to uh, to look to more of this. And just to give you an example, we, we know that, uh, for example, in the future, um, we, we have access what we call the uh, Pyro, I don't know again in in in, the, in English, but that's that's the bassin pyrographic, um, the pyro shed. No, I don't recall. Well, anyway, so the places where a, a fire could affect a given communities or uh, uh, given infrastructures, and because of climate change, we know that fires could could come much further away than today. To affect the same infrastructure because the conditions will be much more severe so fire could travel much quicker and uh, from much further away to affect even communities than before so given that we have to adapt the the way that we are mitigating uh fires around those communities we have to take into account climate change yeah thank you Ian. next question for you um can you comment at all on the incidences of fire in the urban rural interface, that is areas on the boundaries of cities uh, and towns that and the natural forest. Was there more or less of these forests throughout Canada? Are municipalities ready for these types of wildfire? That's that's a really good question. And uh, there are colleagues that actually look at the uh, how uh, forests are getting uh, more flammable around or less flammable around uh, communities in, in Canada. And actually, probably because of fire suppression history in the in those communities. So we, we brought down fires a lot in those regions. Actually, because of that, uh, the, the wildland urban interface or the, 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 the landscape just around the communities are now more flammable than they were before because uh, before they were affected by more fire so they were there was less fuel but now we are actually accumulating fuels around a lot of communities uh, in the wildland urban interface in, in uh, for many communities or or infrastructure so we have to prepare for that uh, we have first to know the risk uh, there are a lot of communities or a lot of uh, it, it's not how can i say that it's there is no wall-to-wall -wall or national or even provincial, in some case, uh, assessment that says, well, this community is much more at risk than another. So knowing knowing the risk is, is very important. And then once you know the risk, you can uh, better identify uh, strat strategies to, to mitigate this risk. And that's pretty much what, what we saw in Quebec last year. Uh, there, there were a lot of, uh, of communities actually that had to uh, build a uh, fire break in a hurry. Uh, they were not prepared for that. They didn't know that actually there could be at risk to uh, to fires. And now 
it's much more uh, it's much more the case. I would uh, I would say they are much more aware, but still much of them have and they and you know they, there is a, a bill project right now that is and one of the proposition in the bill is to uh, for for Quebec a provincial bill that says that uh, each community uh, or regional community will have to conduct risk assessment. Uh, that is also including fire risk um, for, for the next coming years. So they will have to be aware of the fire risk. Yeah. Thank you, Yin. Uh, one more question for you is from the chat. Uh, are there any mitigative actions that Quebec is taking in areas that may be more susceptible to fires? Yeah, so uh, there was some, uh, of course, it's not the, the federal government that was involved, but I know the province is actually uh, funding uh, mitigation measures uh, through the uh, the uh, Ministry of Public Security. Um, uh, and uh, like I mentioned before, there is actually now a bill uh, project, a bill project that is looking at increasing the the awareness and uh, uh, of the the different communities uh, for public safety measures actually um, in the area uh, one thing also that is changing is uh, the sub it, itself which is a uh, the our provincial agencies here for uh, fire protections fire suppression and protection and uh, before it was under the uh, forest department or forest ministry or a natural resources uh, ministry, and now it will be under the public safety uh, ministry. Uh, so it means that that there's a shift in the um, in the way that the the, the, the risk will be assessed by uh, by the subfoot. Thank you, Ian. All right. If there are no more questions coming up, I would like to bring this session to a close. Thank you all for participating in our CIF electronic lectures. And once again, thank you very much to Ian for the great presentation. Bye everyone. Thanks.